Okay, perfect. I see that it started recording. Um, and it's 1001, so we'll just get started. I can, I'll, I'll kick us off. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Carpenter with Lakeshore Technical College. I'm the session host for today's session with Luke Conkle from Moraine Park Technical College and his presentation on the 6th R, reskinning the Open Educational RPG. So the Wisconsin Open Education Symposium Code of Conduct is in effect during this session. And please just take a moment to reflect on how your actions can build up our open education community and support diverse voices. So this session is being recorded and will be captioned for future viewing. Uh, but thanks for joining us today. So Luke, take it away. All right. So uh, yeah, as, uh, as she said, my name is Luke Conkle. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Moraine Park Technical College, uh, where I'm an instructional designer. Um, I'm also a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, uh, where I study play and games and education um, and historical reenactment, oddly enough. Um, and uh, I also teach a course at uh, UW Green Bay, where on uh, games and culture. So um, this is all just to say that I'm kind of interested in role playing games wherever they fit. Um, and so that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. All right, so uh, I've been thinking a lot lately about um, tabletop role playing games in the classroom, uh, generally speaking, um, and a lot about OER. And uh, this talk sort of came out of um, a realization that I had that those things kind of fit together. Um, and I'm not sure why I didn't notice it earlier. Um, so, what we're going to talk about today is first of all, what is reskinning um, or retheming if. Uh, Reskinning is kind of a, a gross <laughs> term. Um, and then we'll uh, get thinking a little bit about um, tabletop role playing games as OER um, and why we might use tabletop role playing games in the classroom anyway. Um, reasons that we might want to reskin games um, in that context. Uh, and then I'll go over some of the, the basic things, some really sort of surface level. Um, game design things that we might want to think about if this is something that we want to do um, and then touch on some practical considerations um, some hiccups or bumps that you might anticipate um, and then i have some examples of games that you can use to to get started and then a, a call to action which um, won't be surprising by the end which is basically i think that this is something that you should try all right so what is uh reskinning or retheming um so the the, type, the description of the talk kind of gave you this, but uh, it's the game design practice of keeping the mechanics of play, um, which is the actual rules and um, moves and uh, what what players are doing when they're playing a game uh, while modifying the narrative and the theme. So uh, this is an ex just an example of uh, a game by Ravensburger. This is actually a, a tabletop board game, not a role playing game um, called Labyrinth. Um, but there's like a whole, there's the Harry Potter labyrinth, there's an ocean labyrinth, there's a Pokemon lab labyrinth um, on the slide here. Uh, but in each of those cases, it's it's the same game and just the theme is different. Uh, and uh, if you play Monopoly, Monopoly is very good at doing the same thing. And sometimes, you know, they'll they'll add or tweak a rule here or there to make the theme make more sense. But um, by and large, it's just giving the game a new theme. Um, and this is something that uh, tabletop role playing game people uh, are already familiar with. If um, if you're in that space, um, people that play like Dungeons and Dragons you know, from the very beginning would um, create modules and campaigns that would try to set Dungeons and Dragons in space, right? So instead of casting spells, you are using um, science fiction computery type equipment and that sort of thing. So, so reskinning is not particularly new, but um, so um, I was just going to talk a little bit about what got me thinking about tabletop role playing games as OER potentially. Um, and I, I kind of alluded to this at the very beginning, which is that um, for a long time, I've been running tabletop role playing games um, and Anybody that runs any amount of tabletop role playing games probably 
does a certain amount of what's called home brewing, where you're taking certain aspects of different um, campaign settings or different mechanics from different games, um, such as you know like rolling different dice to to do different things, um, and you kind of cobble them together to suit your players or the the story that you want to tell or the um, or the setting that you're in. Um, and what that amounts to is uh, retaining, revising, reusing, and remixing. Um, but what it doesn't what it doesn't capture is redistributing. Typically, what happens is um, you homebrew those on a bunch of um, index cards and you keep them behind your your game master screen or whatever. Um, and then you you go out and you on different forums or whatever you probably talk about. The experience of it, but you're not actually sharing out those materials. Um, so somehow I never really drew the connection between those those four of the five R's, and um, and OER um, until uh, what the internet has called the OGL debacle or the OGL fiasco. Um, and so I was just going to summarize that a little bit. Um, and so what happened is in late. 2022 and then early 2023, Wizards of the Coast, which is a subsidiary of Hasbro um, and owns Dungeons and Dragons, leaked a revision of what they called the open game license. Uh, and so what the open game license was originally was a document that, or a license um, that Wizards of the Coast put out that said you can use certain pieces of the Dungeons and Dragons rule set, um, in particular a uh, a pared down version of the rules called the System Reference Document or SRD. And what the Open Game License said was that you could make a game compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, and you could use their terms for different dice rolls and things and different mechanics, and you could even take phrases and terms as you as much as you wanted to out of that system reference document as long as you included a copy of the open game license in your game and that was all well and good and and it, it basically was a way for people to do that re redistribute that that fifth r of the of their dungeons and dragons homebrew content what happened initially was that the open game license made it so that a whole bunch of people were creating content for Dungeons and Dragons and eventually Wizards of the Coast would pick up some of that content and turn them into um, you know, sort of sanctioned Wizards of, Wizards of the Coast products and um, it turned out to be rather lucrative for them because more people were buying Dungeons and Dragons so that they could play these modules that were compatible with the system. Uh, but recently, um, Wizards of the Coast has been sort of losing out because um, folks were using the open game license and then going on Kickstarter and making, you know, multiple millions of dollars on Dungeons and Dragons compatible products that were not owned by Wizards of the Coast. Okay, so long story short, um, they leaked this revision of the open game license in at the end of 2022. Um, and essentially they wanted people that used the OGL to have to report their revenue to Wizards of the Coast, and then they developed a sort of royalty structure based on that. And they were they decided that they wanted to restrict the use of the open game license to primarily print materials. So if you publish something as a PDF or on a virtual tabletop, um, sort of like a Zoom for role playing games, um, they wanted you to use a a different version of it. And and uh, the internet kind of, that. Internet, at least in the role playing game space, sort of blew up around this um, this situation. Um, and in fact, some third party publishers announced that they would no longer be creating content for Dungeons and Dragons. And some of them said that they were creating their own system and creating their their own licenses. Um, and this got me thinking about tabletop role playing games as OER. Um, because of this, um, the, commu the community backlash that came with this. So um, the catch with the open game license is that nobody ever really needed it uh, to begin with. Um, 
and I mean, it sort of depends who you ask um, and I'm not a lawyer. So, <laughs> so take this with a grain of salt, but um, the. By and large, the tabletop role playing. Publishing world um, agrees that um, and the US Supreme Court ostensibly agrees that you cannot actually copyright game mechanics. Um, rather, you can copyright um, the written version of those mechanics. So the what the the OGL succeeded in saying that the system reference document was usable by anyone. Um, but people took that to mean that the whole system of Dungeons and Dragons um, it, it, from at the at the very level of mechanics couldn't be replicated by anybody else. So you couldn't roll a D, you know, have a, a strength stat, a statistic, and then roll a 20 sided die um, and have a target number of 12 to do, you know, X, um, which it, over time they, they, the courts have determined that that's actually not the case, that you can do that. You just can't phrase it in your rule book the way that Wizards of the Coast did. Um, particularly in the system reference document. Um, and so there's, I have a couple of court cases listed here. Um, Baker versus Selden is actually really interesting because it's, um, it's a, an accountant sued another accountant about um, a system of bookkeeping. Um, and interestingly enough, that's where this, um, these other cases, um, that that's the precedent that they use, which in that, in that Supreme Court case, they decided that, you know, ideas cannot be copyrighted or trademarked, um, but the representation of them in the real world, that's what can be copyrighted and trademarked. Um, and then Atari versus Zynga, that was a, um, Atari made a, a knockoff of Farmville, if you remember that um, Facebook game. Um, and they, they said that Atari was fine to do that as long as they didn't call it Farmville and they didn't call the things in the game um, the same thing, um, that mechanically it could be identical. And then um, Da Vinci Editress versus uh, Zico Games. I don't remember what the game was there, but it was another it was another case where they um, they said the same thing that the um, the actual mechanics of the game um, can't be copyrighted, but you know the way that you phrase them and, and write about them um, can be. So um, how this actually got me to thinking about OER uh, was that. Um, was in that community backlash and that the um, th this already this highlighted a set of problems that have that Dungeons and Dragons in particular but tabletop role playing games in general have had since the very beginning of you know publishing role playing games um, and it it created a shift in the role playing game space that sort of demanded more openness, um, which is something that actually the hobby has had since the very beginning. Um, so there's you know, sort of a, not not necessarily underground, but unseen uh, world of, you know, Xerox photocopies um, all the way back in the 1980s um, of people, you know, sharing their homebrew modules with their friends. Um, and that's actually where we got um, one of the um, most popular um, settings for Dungeons and Dragons, which is the Ravenloft setting. So if you're into vampires, since we're getting close to Halloween, that's, you know, I recommend it. Um, and every version of Dungeons and Dragons has had a, a version of Ravenloft because, you know, and it all came out of somebody's homebrew campaign. Okay. So um, this is all to say that um, the mechanics of games are, um, I guess, pun intended, fair use or a uh, fair game for um, for uh, use in the classroom or use in um, creating uh, an, a game um, of something that, you know, in our context might be something like, you know, cell biology or um, chemistry versus, um, you know, sort of a fantasy, vaguely medieval um, Dungeons and Dragons type setting. Um, so, we can talk a little bit um, broadly then about um, games, and um, I, I think my, 
my goal here is to, um, I guess, convince you that there there is a case for tabletop role playing games being used in the classroom or games in general, um, so that um, you do feel like it's worth taking those mechanics that you do have access to and turning them into something. Um, so um, transmedia is kind of a, a academic -y kind of buzzword um, way of thinking about games, um, but there's a, a person in that space named Jesper Jewell, which is just a great name, um, who talks about games um, as having six properties. Um, and I'll just, I'll read through them kind of quickly here, um, which is that they have a fixed set of rules, but they have negotiable consequences that, um, and this for, for an educational purpose, like this to me is kind of the bread and butter is that players have an, have an attachment to those, to the outcomes, um, that are built into those, uh, no negotiable consequences. And that as a result, um, number four is that there's some player effort. Um, which means that um, players can do something and have an impact on what that outcome is. Um, and then the fifth element is variable outcomes, which, you know, is obviously really related to negotiable consequences. Um, and then finally, there's, um, this, he calls it valor in the outcomes. So because they had a, a stake in what the outcomes were, they, um, they, it has an effect on them when the game is over. So if you've ever played a game and, you know, you, at the end of the game, you got into that conversation of like, well, if I had just drawn that one card, or if I had just, if I had rolled one higher on that one roll, um, that's, that's kind of what he's talking about there. Um, and then, you know, a role-playing game is just a, a particular example of that. Um, so you have a, sort of a definition there. I have a little bit of a, Problem with the definition, but you know it's it's good enough for us. Um, so a game in which the participants assume the perspective of, which for us is probably a key element, um, and then control characters in a given setting. Um, so um, it, that perspective acts aspect is really important, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in those, that list below. But um, just keeping in mind that. We this this doesn't apply just to role playing games. Role playing games is just you know where my thinking has been around this. So, um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the pedagogical value of um, games in general, but particularly role playing games, um, which all comes down to the fact that they are complex systems, which I, apparently I thought was important enough. I put it on the slide twice. Um, so, what do I mean by a complex system? Um, or what do I mean about by the significance of a complex system? Um, so because role-playing games or games in particular are themselves complex systems, they can help illustrate other complex systems. So they can make a system more transparent and um, they can help their players draw connections um, and realize the effects of actions. Um, and so, this is all just a way of saying that they make abstractions less abstract um, by form forming them into uh, something bound together by a set of rules. Um, so they can help students to um, actually. I could I could talk a little bit about those citations there. So um, Armstrong talks about using Settlers of Catan, which is a tabletop game, um, to talk about uh, statistics uh, probability. Um, Bridge uses, uh, I think it's Battleship, um, and he's actually doing a, he's trying to teach about federalism and anti-federalism. And so he actually use, has his students um, play Battleship twice, once on a team where they can communicate um, in real time, and once uh, where they have to communicate by passing notes back and forth, which is supposed to represent anti-federalism. Um, and then you know, reflect on that experience. So um, there it's it's not even reskinning the game, it's just um, tweaking the game in a way that um, reveals something about a subject. Um, and then Klingabiel is talking about um, using card, familiar card and board games um, in, a, in a medical education context. Um, so role-playing games uh, in particular, um, 
also emphasize um, working together um, and solving problems. Uh, so, you know, critical thinking, um, again, that abstraction piece. Um, and then, um, let's see, those two, these two uh, sources, um, Collins and company um, talks, actually does a really nice job of just breaking down um, where role-playing games fit into um, education. And then Donato and Snyder Broussard um, talks about um, games in terms of information literacy. So, um, and then uh, what I mean by directionality of education is, you know, if you're, depending on if your game, if your game style, if your teaching style is sort of uh, bottom up or inside out, in, in, yeah, inside out or um, top down, um, if you think about like the role of a, a game master, which is the person that runs a tabletop role playing game typically, um, that's sort of top down. But then if you have, um, your students, if you have one of them taking on the role of game master, um, it could be sort of inside out. Um, you could have your students actually be developing role playing games and that's bottom up. Um, and then um, it, it's hard to um, talk about anything these days without talking about um, AI, but um, role playing games also can be highly experiential. So, like, um, uh, what are you saying? Uh, High impact practices or authentic assessments. Um, the and then the the citations there. Ellis and Hendler talk about, um, if I'm rem remembering right, the title is something like, "Computers play chess, humans play Dungeons and Dragons," um, and about how, um, you know, you can't you can't strictly logic your way out of a uh, role playing game scenario. You have to collaborate with other people and um, use your critical thinking skills. And then um, I'm trying to remember what the um, the Witten article is about. Is the uh, the place of game based learning in the age of something? Uh, but I related it to AI in my head. So. Hey, Luke, you have a question Sorry. come in? Yeah. Um, and a comment <laughs> RPG standing for rocket propelled grenade, but you cleared that up. What are yeah. <laughs> role playing games? Sorry. Yeah. And then uh, the second question is um, role playing game structure sounds a lot like the learning that takes place in the classroom. Could you see this useful for scenario situations such as nursing? And you kind of covered it with that uh, experiential, but maybe you want to expand further. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that um, I I thank you for that question because I forgot to mention it in in the what got me thinking about this slide because I was holding forth on Wizards of the Coast, um, is that uh, nursing and um, I, I'm actually working with an instructor on a hazardous materials course right now. Um, some of those um, hands on you know interacting with um, people interacting with the community um, subjects, um, they do have really good, you know, well-built um, scenarios that a lot of times come with those, you know, 80 or 120 or $200 textbooks um, or their online platform for um, uh, for, facility, for using that textbook. Um, and so this, you know, taking a, an off-the-shelf uh, role-playing or off the web, I guess, uh, role-playing game and using it to construct those scenarios, um, since you are the expert in um, what students should be getting out of that, um, that experience, um, is, a, is a way to, um, to, to provide that, you know, um, practice level um, engagement with that material um, without having to draw from those, um, from those sources, which um, can be cost prohibitive. So, um, yeah, great question. All right. My slide will not advance. There we go. Um, so, let's see. Um, so, the basics, of, I guess, of getting started, if this is something that is interesting to you, um, which is to think about 
um, that idea that a game is really just a complex system. You know, it has inputs and out, and then you manipulate those inputs in some way, and then you have an output. Um, and so, if if what you are teaching is can be explained as a complex system, which I would venture to um, suggest that it can, um, there's pro there's probably a role playing game um, version of it. And you know that I'm not I'm not going to argue that you know role playing games should be your um, your uh, your summative assessment for you know um, brain surgery, but um, it's a it they're a pretty stellar way to um, introduce and then maybe practice um, some of those skills, um, particularly the ones about um, interaction. Um, and, um, and even just, you know, uh, defining or explaining that system, um, sort of at a top level. So, um, when you think about, uh, so in game design terms, we have theme dynamics, mechanics, and materials. Um, and those, those things always, um, play on each other. Uh, again, no pun intended. Um, and your, your, so your theme is essentially your objectives. So if you think about this from a, a course design uh, perspective, um, that's your overall concept. You know, what is the, what is the complex system that you want students to be thinking about? Um, and it's, it's your setting. So, you know, if you think about um, that, uh, that first example of the, the maze game or labyrinth game, you know, the setting is, um, Adventurers in a, a traditional maze, but then when it gets rethemed, it's you know underwater or Pokemon, something like that. Um, you know, if you think about a, a the you know sort of classic game Risk, um, there's a, a version of Risk that's Game of Thrones, I think these days, um, and so that's it's it, it gives a different um, sensation of that same experience, um, which maybe says something about complex systems being more alike than different. Than, uh, this may be a talk for another day. Um, dynamics is um, the way that you want characters or players um, to interact with each other. Um, so depending on what the quote unquote characters in your game are, um, the dynamics are going to be different. So, you know, are they, you know, adversarial, um, you know, uh, germ cells and antibodies or that sort of thing? Um, or is this a, is this a cooperative situation where you know everybody has to work together to execute a business process or something like that? Um, mechanics then are the the actual rules, like when do you roll um, dice and what do those dice rolls um, actually signify? Um, and then um, materials are those those things, like the you know what else do you need? Do you need a do you need a map or a diagram or a a, a play area? Um, are they going to roll dice? Are they going to draw cards? Um, and then, um, I have the, the Jenga tower on here, um, as an example of how these, these themes, these things all fit together. Um, so there's a tabletop role playing game called dread, uh, where instead of using, uh, 20 sided dice, like Dungeons and Dragons uses a Jenga tower. And the way that the, the game works is it's, um, uh, it's a, a horror setting. Um, with like vampires and zombies and that sort of thing. And um, when a character wants to do something that um, comes with a risk, the person running the game will instruct them to take, to do, do a Jenga move. So they have to take a, a block out of the Jenga tower and put it on top, just like in, when you play normal Jenga. Um, and so that so the Jenga tower is the mechanic. The theme is you know post apocalyptic horror, um, and the dynamic is how players are interacting, you know, making the decisions about what they're going to do next to, and, and sort of like negotiating, you know, what is what is the sort of easy move so that I don't have to take a Jenga block, because when you when the Jenga block falls down, everybody is killed <laughs> essentially or you know narratively depending on what the the, the story is um that 
everybody loses collectively. Um, and so the the, mechan the me mechanics and the dynamics you can feel are building to that theme, right? Because there's this, every time you take a Jenga block, you're building tension into the game. Um, and then the materials obviously are the, are the, the blocks for the Jenga tower. Um, so then um, anybody that knows me um, knows that I have a Bob Ross quote in pretty much every presentation I do. Um, but here he's talking about, you know, adding um, pink to the sky. Uh, of his painting, but he's, you know, he notes that you can always add more, but it's a son of a gun to try to take it out. Um, and that's, that's sort of like a cardinal rule in tabletop role playing games as well, which is that, you know, if, if you feel like there's something that needs to be captured in the game that it isn't, um, try it out as it is and see if there's something that's already there that you can use. Um, so, you know, uh, if we if we're thinking about something like Dungeons and Dragons or a traditional sort of they call it a D20 system because you use a 20 sided die. Um, rather than saying, oh, here's this spe special situation where now instead you're going to roll two six sided dice and take the higher number and do this other thing. Is there a way that we can just use that core 20 sided die again? Um, and maybe just add a number to it or something like that. Um, Sort of, it's sort of that keep it simple uh, principle, um, just because it can, because we're dealing with complex systems, it can get um, overly complex um, really quickly. And so that's where thinking about that theme or that objective, or like what is the experience that, you know, the dynamics um, that you actually want players to have. So in the dread example, you want to be building tension. Um, and so what are the mechanics that actually, you know, can do that? Um, and so these are things that you you would have to think about more if you were building a game, you know, totally from scratch. Um, but because what I'm suggesting that we do here is um, take existing games and give them a new theme um, and some framing language. Um, this is not this is not something that you need to be terribly concerned with, other than the fact that you know you might have to add something or adjust something um, to make it make sense for the situation that you're trying to to capture. Um, I'm just trying to think if I have anything else that. Um, so I guess I would just add um, just to sort of summarize this slide um, is that the simplest place to start is to to identify what your setting is, you know, like what are your what is the theme? What is your objective? And then what are the what are the players going to actually represent? And then um, what are then the relevant you know stats or um, attributes of those um, those characters? And then how how can those attributes be used to determine outcomes? Um, and then from there, it's it kind of um, it's it's just a matter of mapping that onto an existing game. So it does take a little bit of research to find um, games to start with, but um, we can we'll we'll have a list that we can talk about a little bit, and then um, maybe at the end, if we have a little bit of time, we can play stump the chump, and you can give me your your subject, and I can point you in a direction. Um, all right. So some some practical considerations. Um, Complexity, I kind of uh, touched on uh, in the in the last slide, is um, game design can be it can be deceptively simple, but it also can be deceptively difficult. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be as hard as I think some people make it. I think some people that want to design a game set out to make the next you know Settlers of Catan um, or Monopoly or whatever, um, and uh, but that that isn't uh it isn't backwards design and it's not uh it's not you know it's not objective space thinking right um if you when when people when the designer of settlers of catan set out to make that game he didn't set out to make settlers of catan he just he set out to make a uh a game that actually captured the way that he saw the the economics of um of a, of a situation. And so, and he just wanted to make something that was fun for his family to play. Um, it's actually kind of an interesting history of that game. Um, 
And so I, I would say that, you know, practically don't set out to make something super complex. Um, start with your objectives and keep that in mind and let that drive your, your, your decisions. Um, accessibility can be a, uh, a bit of a concern, um, in, especially if you're using um, digital content. Um, and uh, some of the games that are open are, especially some of the, the earlier ones, um, were it scra scrawled out in, you know, like with a Sharpie and then scanned and uploaded to the internet. Um, they've since, been, they've, many of them have since had an update, but, um, you know, making sure that, you know, it, your version is accessible, uh, especially if you're gonna redistribute it. Um, and then um, safety tools is, um, is is probably not as as big of a consideration um, in in some of our context. You know, if you're doing taking if you're like a cell biologist or something, that's the example that's really stuck in the head for some reason. Um, but if you're doing something like nursing, that might be uh, it might be a consideration. And safety tools is something that has been around in tabletop role playing games for a really long time, but um, only recently has it become like a really significant and um, important part of the, the ongoing conversation. Um, and this involves a lot of times like having, they call it an X card, where it's it's literally like a card with an X on it that sits on the table. And if if the story that you're telling reaches a point where somebody is uncomfortable for whatever reason, they can you know tap the X card. Um, there's also you know, a version of it that's like a, a pause, rewind, you know, and then uh, fade to black, I think, um, where, you know, it, there, there are mechanisms that are built into the game so that, you know, as things get touchy, um, that people have sort of a, a release valve um, to, to, to stop and interrogate that experience instead of, um, you know, sort of barreling forward in a way that makes people uncomfortable. Um, and then um, play testing is, um, is a, so I started there um, as a consideration uh, because it's, it's something that when you, when you take a game and you reskin it, you think, oh, okay, I can, I can take this um, lasers and feelings as a game that uh, I'll mention on the next page. Um, and I'll just replace uh, lasers with, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of an example that somebody could use, um, with, uh, uh, vitamins and I'll replace feelings with minerals, uh, in a nutrition course or something like that. Um, but then when you, you know, and then you retheme the game. Um, but if you don't play test it, a lot of times, you know, it, it, like games work really well in your head and they work really well on paper but then when people start playing them they're always going to find little things that um that that don't quite map on to that that objective that you started with uh, at the beginning um and so you know play testing is a practical consideration in that you definitely need to do it um but it's also um it's also a way to um respond to that Bob Ross quote, right? That is there something that you need to add? Um, is this too complex? Is there something that we need to take away um, and, you know, go back to that sort of core mechanic? Um, and I, it sounds, it, I mean, it is a lot of work. And so it sounds like it is a lot of work, but one thing that I would consider you thinking about is um, being upfront with your, if this is something that you do, being upfront with your students and saying, hey, um, you are the the play test audience for this thing, um, and then elicit their feedback. Um, you know, based on based on their sort of traditional learning of the material, and then their playthrough. Do they think that it maps on to their understanding of that? Um, and those that sort of feedback from your students can be really telling. Um, and then you can, because it is OER, you can revise, um, and then um, and then go from there. Um, Playtesting is never done. All right, Luke, you have five minutes left. And we Perfect. also have another question uh, from D. He says, my favorite tabletop RPG game is above and be below. Did you implement this in face-to-face -face class or online class? And he asked, what subject do you teach? Yeah, so um, I, 
I have not yet played above and below. Um, and I, my class at Green Bay is online, um, but I helped an instructor um, in my at my former institution do uh, develop a. He he, he actually turned his whole class into a, a tabletop role playing game, which is and he taught creative writing, um, and um, some of the intro level comp courses. Um, and so it was. Uh, he actually turned. It's a little bit meta, but instead of turning the subject of the course into the role playing game, he turned the um, sort of hidden curriculum and the growth mindset that he had that was his sort of philosophy of the course into the game. So the the students were essentially playing themselves um, and growing in experience as they they worked their way through the game. Um, so um, that. Um, and that class was that it implemented face to face. Um, so, and you know, I, I teach anthropology, um, which is a lot about, uh, <laughs> obviously social interaction and the way that people work together. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, I actually just, uh, at UW Milwaukee, we brought in a speaker, um, who talked about, um, a sort of a, a long history of, um, race in, um, Role playing games, um, and then we played a um, a setting of Dungeons and Dragons that um, helped us carry carry on a conversation about um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in role playing. Um, and so that one again was it was it was sort of, um, and that was a, a a Dungeons and Dragons setting written by Wizards of the Coast that actually um, was it was a, a Essentially, a reskin of um, typical role playing games um, to sort of highlight some of those those issues. Um, but uh, so yeah, so this is just a um, a, a list of um, role playing games um, that are out there that you can um, that have um, that are sort of like I would say the low hanging fruit for for retheming. Um, if you go, if you do a search on itch.io for um, the, they call them the one page RPG contests um, or game jams, sorry, one page RPG game jams. Um, a lot of those are good examples of people that have, have reskinned existing role playing games. Um, and they, they come up to come down to these theme swappers that I have here. But um, so retro clones are games that try to be, um, like old school Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so there I have Cairn, Knave, and um, actually I have it right in front of me. Uh, basic fantasy role playing game, which is the that's the game that I um, I run my quote unquote Dungeons and Dragons. If you use Dungeons and Dragons, like you know, like Kleenex, right? It's a, um, and those are all Creative Commons um, uh, versions of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I should mention too that, you know, especially given my DEI example just now, um, that another thing that you can do is um, instead of re theming the game, you can use the existing game and just write a setting that um, that illustrates the, the situation that um, that you want. So here at Cairn and Nave actually are a little bit more um, accessible in terms of like, you know, low barrier to entry. Um, so those would be good contenders for for that where you know you want your your characters to be walking through a hospital and the non-player characters are you know um attending physicians or something um instead of you know wizards in a tower um so setting ready games um those are those are games that um are that are would be good too for what i sort of what i just mentioned so gumshoe is a um is a, a game where the, well, your students, I guess the players are um, private investigator type, um, you know, hard boiled detective. Um, and uh, so any sort of investigation type game, um, there's, a, and then Fate is a, it's a, a system that uses six sided dice, so 20 sided dice. So again, it's a little bit more accessible. Um, and Fate is actually designed that you can play pretty much any setting. Um, so then theme swappers, those are very, um, 
very low barrier to entry. Um, so Honey Heist, the actual game is um, you're playing bears that are trying to steal honey. And then um, Lasers and Feelings is uh, is sort of a, a knockoff on uh, Star Trek. Um, and in both of those games, you only have two stats instead of, you know, like strength and dexterity and intelligence, whatever. Um, so like in Lasers and Feelings, your stats are lasers and feelings. Um, and you roll a, a six-sided, anytime you want to do something that's contested, you roll a six-sided die and then you either use your, so, and then you have a number, say it's three. If you're doing lasers, you want to roll under a three. And if you're doing feelings, you want to roll over a three. Um, and so um, it it packs a lot of, you know, conceptual thinking into that one really simple, straightforward mechanic. So you could just switch uh, your, the theme of, you know, Star Trek to um, whatever your setting is, and then determine what those two stats are. Um, and then if you're, if you're a, a glutton for punishment, there's um, some really more involved games that you could um, either take and apply as a setting or reskin into um, something that suited your, your discipline. We have um, HG Wells, with two, uh, two games that are public domain because they're from the UK and they're super old. Um, and then Horde is uh, a role playing game where you actually play the dungeon or play the dragon in the dungeon that's like hoarding his treasure. And then um, Myriad is sort of a, a tries to be sort of a universal uh, role playing game system. But again, it's a very, uh, it's very involved because of everything it tries to, to capture. All right, Luke, and your ad time. Um, sure. Look at you, you filled it all up. And yeah. so just we're a little bit over, but we are welcome. Anyone who, who maybe wants to chat with you after, yeah. you're welcome to stay in this room. Um, Luke, if you wouldn't mind just hitting the, the stop recording button. Um, but if anyone else has questions, um, and Luke, if you have a bit of time, you're welcome.